The Middle Ages had no lack of colorful characters to focus on, but what about the Renaissance? The world had an overhaul of arts and science, giving rise to some of the biggest names in all of history, like Leonardo da Vinci and William Shakespeare. But behind those names lie some of the most controversial ones as well, like the Borgia family, who for generations scandalized Southern Europe and the Catholic Church. Rumors of incest, papal orgies, and familial murder abound this week on the Gems of History podcast. How'd I do? Oh, just, I thought that was the start of the joke that you said. No, I haven't. Ooh, I'm I, like, who goes there? I had to like decompress after that. I was oh, like, just take a big, big, big stress. A big stress. <laughs> oh, goodness. What a time. We're back, baby. No, we're no, back. My joke is this week we're going to be talking about the Borgias. Hope we don't bore you. That, that was all right. That was all right. That was all right. Man, uh, I was thinking right. all week about that. Well, you know what? You're looking pretty gorgeous today. Oh, thank you. I appreciate. I, actually, I don't know if that's a good thing. <laughs> yeah, this family's not really the best reputation. Yeah, right. <laughs> Wait a minute. But that also, they're just, me they were just poisoning to, me. They were said to be super hot, so I guess I'll take it. For what it is, they weren't bad looking from all historical records. But then it's the classic. Uh, well, the kids were good looking, at least. <laughs> right. No, I heard Rodrigo. Rodrigo was a yeah, probably was a heart slayer. He, all the, all the pictures of him as Pope are just like big fat man with a huge bird nose <laughs> it's always and also it's always funny revisiting these old paintings yeah when the descriptions are they were fair blonde haired never like no wrinkles on their skin la di da medieval words or renaissance words then you look at the pictures and it's yeah it's like i could have drawn that <laughs> yeah <laughs> hello everybody welcome to the gems of history podcast i'm your host jacob shop and join me as always evan roosh we're back. It's been two weeks. We're for us, anyway. Yeah. <laughs> yeah for, for you guys, it's only been a week. But for us, it's been two weeks. Yeah, it's been some time. Uh, I forgot. It, it's amazing what an extra week off does to the rhythm of doing a podcast. It really will kind of F you up a and little bit. And an entire there. weekend of drinking. <laughs> oh, yeah. We both were part of a bachelor party this past weekend. So for uh, our buddy Austin, who's been on the show. Yeah. Shout out, Austin. Shout out, Austin. It was a good time. Good time. Who play a lot of paintball too? There, there was some stories heard by us that weekend. Some stories, yeah, <laughs> some so myths and legends. Almost got a tick in my literal butt, so that was fun. Had to have my friend look at my butt in the morning. <laughs> Just to clarify, I was not that friend. No, I was not. It was actually the bachelor. <laughs> I had, ah. to, had to look at it. So that, thank you, Austin, <laughs> for for making sure I didn't die of Lyme's disease. And he never came on the show again. <laughs> and he didn't talk to him ever again. Uh, but yeah, we had a, a fun weekend. But we're back, and we're talking about Renaissance controversy controversies. The family that I think most people think of when they think Renaissance. I, yeah, and, I think at least. <laughs> and as I mentioned to Evan before we started recording, for a family that is like the most well-known family of the Renaissance, surprisingly not as much information online as you would hope to find. Shockingly low amount of info. I don't know if that's just the case of the times or if maybe there was just an eradication of facts at some point, but who knows? Yeah, I don't know. I think it... it partially might be due just to the fact that recent historians have been kind of rewriting the story of the Borgia uh, family just because it was so one-sided for centuries. Yeah. And now they're kind of trying to to verify things and make sure that it's actually true if it is c that controversial, but right making sure that we're right about history and these historical <laughs> people. Yeah, uh but yeah, today we're talking about the Borgia family. If you don't know what the Borgia family is, they're basically a, a two to three generations depending on how you want to look at it of people from Spain who transplanted to Italy and kind of took over the papacy for about 100 not a, not 100 years, maybe a little less than 100 years. But. Just about, yeah. I mean, two popes and two or three generations. Yeah. That's pretty impressive. Granted, one of them only 
is Pope for three years, but but I mean, <laughs> he, he actually does quite a bit in that three years. So, yeah, that's what we're going to be talking about today. Uh, it, we do a lot of medieval stuff. We don't really do a lot of Renaissance stuff, honestly. So I think this is one of our first forays kind of into it. Because the Renaissance was too happy for this show. Yeah, honestly. We're being quite honest, we always cover the most, not the most evil things that happen in history, but we don't usually cover the the happy-go-lucky stories. And I, this one's not, uh, I guess it is kind of happy-go-lucky, just mm. in how f- carefree everyone in the story is. Yeah. But it's also not a good story. No, <laughs> like, not one From bit. the aspect of morality. It's the one black spot of the renaissance let's say that and the syphilis zombies that yeah, that too uh one of the guys in the story had syphilis so that was fun for him yeah that's a shout out <laughs> him <laughs> so what happens when you go and colonize a country that doesn't want to be colonized but anyways should we jump into the, <laughs> i digress <laughs> should we jump into the story of the the borgia family evan oh yeah the center of renaissance italy was as you can expect, an interesting place. Uh, As I mentioned in the preamble, it housed really big names, uh, like Michelangelo, for example. But at the same time, it was a very turbulent place. France and Italy were fighting constantly, as they're wont to do, and Italy itself was very unstable politically. Fortunes and power shifted at a moment's notice, and people were dying or being killed all over the place. And on top of all that was where the Pope sat. Because basically, in addition to being a religious leader for the Catholics, the Pope also ran things as basically a king. And he still had to contend with the other kings in the area, like the King of France or the King of England. So the Pope wasn't necessarily beholden to nobody, but the power that the Pope wielded at this time was much different than what we know the power of the Pope to be today. Yeah, you couldn't do anything without the Pope's approval, whether that be attacking a city, like the Pope had approved a lot of the different leaders of cities in Italy specifically. Like you can do too much without the man's blessing, whereas today it's, yeah, it's the guy in the little Pope mobile. He waves real nice. Yes. But also, as we kind of talked about in our Joanna of Naples episode, Mm -hmm. The papacy was kind of split between France and Rome for a little while, and this it, this time period is kind of when it reestablishes its, itself in Rome for the time being, and there's a lot of turmoil just around that and how everyone's kind of trying to regain the trust of the local mm-hmm. Italian people and get them to support them while also trying to make sure that another pope doesn't pop up across like... It, across the Mediterranean or something like that. Right, the so. good old Avignon papacy in yeah. the Avignon kingdom, not to, not to mention. So there's a, a lot going on in that aspect. And amongst all of this was when the Borgia family shows up. The House of Borgia has its roots in a pretty strange normalcy because they were a very minor aristocratic family from Valen- Valencia, which is now in modern-day Spain, but at the time it was known as the Kingdom of Aragon. They were technically a type of noble family, but they didn't really stand out amongst the nobility in any way. They weren't really a big name uh, in Aragon or in Spain. One, I do have to shout out that it's Aragon. Makes me very happy. Lord of the Rings fans rejoice. But yeah, they were really just a middling family. They weren't in line for the throne. They weren't really doing too much in that regard. So they kind of just blended in. In a way, they are a self-made legacy (laughs) oh yeah say what you will about this family they definitely did everything they could to enrich and move their family interests forward and this is literally where the word nepotism comes from yeah (laughs) from this family which is very funny and a very fun fact to to lay out but no they i hate using this using this phrase but they kind of pull themselves up by their by their little boots that they were wearing into the renaissance times and once they have riches, they take to it like ducks to water. <laughs> like it <Yeah>. is instantaneously <laughs> natural for them. Right. It's we made a mistake giving these people money. Yeah. <laughs> the first of the family to really make a name for themselves was Alfonso de Borgia, who was born on New Year's Eve in 1378 and is going to be one of four Alfonsos in this story. Yeah, that's another classic medieval times, Renaissance times. Everyone has the same freaking <laughs> name. Alfonso was likely the firstborn to his parents and was followed by four younger sisters. 
and he went to school to study grammar and Latin until the round, around the age of 14, when he went to do further studies and obtain doctorates in canon or church and civil law. And he proved almost instantaneously to be quite adept at his administrative and legal duties. And this is pretty much how they rise to power, was because they were very good administrators. Yeah, he was a super smart man. He was a stud, some might say. Yeah. <laughs> so he moved up pretty fast in position, and by 1408, at the age of only 30, he was an appointed advisor to King Martin of Aragon, who died from laughing uncontrollably after his jester told him a joke in 1410. I think that's that was on our Wackiest Ways to Die episode. Really? Like, way back in the remember. day. I forgot about it then, because I looked up King Martin of Aragon, and that was the first thing, was he died of laughter. I think, I think he was on there, but then again, my memory's terrible, but yeah. Do you know what the joke was, Evan? Was it your Borgia joke? No, I at the wish. Beginning of the episode? <laughs> that would make yeah. me feel so much yeah, better yeah. about it. But no, he asked his jester where he was because the jester was late, and the jester said, quote, In the next vineyard, where I saw a young deer hanging by his tail from a tree, as if someone had so punished him for stealing figs. <laughs> and that made the king laugh so much that he died. <laughs> <laughs> That's the best assassination plot. <laughs> I really hope it was. Just an assassination plot. That'd be tremendous. But that aside, by 1411, Alfonso was appointed the ecclesiastical judge of the place that he studied at. And then in 1417, he officially entered into the services of Alfonso, King of Aragon. So from, for this little section coming forward, I'm going to say King Alfonso for this, the King of Aragon. And then I'm going to say Borgia for Alfonso de Borgia, just to kind of differentiate between the Alfonso's. Almost immediately. It would have gotten very confusing, so thank you for that. <laughs> so King Alfonso would become a great man in his own right, but at the time when Borgia enters, enters into his services, he was just a pretty much new young king, and he knew he was going to need help in his administrative duties, which is where Alfonso de Borgia came into the picture. So he's already climbing into pretty much the back pocket of figures in high positions in his homeland, at least. Which is almost the best place to be. Not the main guy just yet, but you're right behind them. Yeah, you, you're you the worm tongue. <laughs> to oh my you. god, yeah, Lord of the Rings again. So you don't get blamed until someone figures out, like, you're the reason. You're <laughs> the culprit, yeah, exactly. By 1420, Alfonso de Borgia was vice chancellor of his old university and a permanent member of the royal council after he was sent by the king to help repair relations between eastern and western warring factions in Aragon. So he's already getting sent on pretty important missions to soothe tensions between two halves of a country. Yeah, talk about a big job. Like, hey, you don't know Abe Lincoln yet, but... You're going to have to be the Abe Lincoln of the Renaissance. <laughs> Prevent a civil war. And Alfonso's like, huh? <laughs> he gives him a, t a big stovepipe hat. hat. <laughs> and that's how the papacy was formed. <laughs> Ridiculous hat. His mission was ultimately unsuccessful in its goal, but Alfonso de Borgia was so impressive on his mission that he was taken into the king's council for good. In quick order, Borgia helped repair relations between the Pope and King Alfonso and persuaded an upstart rival Pope to resign and to submit to the actual elected Pope. That's some convincing right there. Very persuasive. This man, like we talked about earlier, like very good speaker. He was a student of the law. Definitely probably knew his religion too as well. So to convince a up-and-coming Pope, which is very funny to say, I was just thinking yeah. of the boxing, like... There's a boxing heavyweight world champion. Then the number one contender. <laughs> yeah. Comes in at 3-0. and oh. <laughs> Yeah, it's just two very old white men. The tail of the tape. But uh, I should mention one of the sources that I use for this. Uh, I listened to an interview with a professor of Renaissance uh, art studies, I believe she was. And they basically went through popular questions on Google and stuff about mm -hmm. the Borgia family to try and clear it up. And when asked about how the Borgias get to power, they were just really good administrators. Yeah. That's how they got to power, which is very mundane for a family that gets such a blown out reputation. Right. Yeah. It's just being like the secretary of state. Yeah. 
So soon after he soothed things with the what they called anti pope, <laughs> he was appointed as a bishop of Valencia, which was a position beneficial for not only Borgia, but for the king as well. Because then he had someone in a very rich area of Spain and he could kind of tell him what to do and how to control that area of his kingdom. Borgia would personally preach to the people of Valencia, extolling the virtues of spiritual order and obligation of clergymen, while also acting against the intervention of secular powers in church matters. Keep that in mind, because that's going to become very ironic later on. Oh, quite a bit, yes. <laughs> it didn't take long for King Alfonso to take control of Naples in, it in Italy, and he quickly moved Borgia into a position to soothe the tense relations between the Pope and King Alfonso. Eventually, a treaty between the two parties was signed, and Alfonso de Borgia became a cardinal of the church while also maintaining his control as a bishop of Valencia. Borgia moved almost immediately to Rome and began a simple religious life. His legal prowess continued to garner him high esteem in the courts, and he officially changed his name to Borgia from the Spanish pronunciation that I'm going to butcher, Borja. 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 Okay. Yeah, Borja. A lot stronger, a lot stronger. Yes. But it's just interesting as well, like you mentioned that he was nominated as a cardinal. The process back then to what it is today, much, much different. Like to become a cardinal, you do have to do the traditional, like your entire life is dedicated to the church, you're in the church, you rise the ranks that way, whereas this man is more of an administrator to the king and eventually is like the king's hand, or excuse me, the king's... uh right-hand man placed in this spot and then becomes a cardinal. Yeah. <laughs> and for those of you that don't know, a cardinal is basically, there's different levels of being a cardinal, but it's a few steps away from becoming a pope. Yeah, and you're part of the voting for electing other popes. Yeah. So it, it's a lot of power that you hold. And he got to this position in 25 years or so from being a nobody. Yeah. It's crazy. Once in Rome, and once he was a cardinal, Alfonso de Borgia began to set up his nephews, as it was kind of the custom at the time to do. And this is kind of where the reputation of the Borgia family truly begins, because he takes an already existing custom and bumps it up to like 15. <laughs> oh, big time. And keep in mind, you're probably wondering, why is it not like his sons or something? I don't believe he had any sons. So for any church officials at the time, it was technically illegal for right. them to marry. Right, so right. any children they did have were illegitimate. Yes. Until you become the Pope, then you can legitimize them. Oh, as he does. The, when you're the Pope, you do whatever you want. Yeah. yeah. But so it was much more customary for these guys to bump up nephews mm -hmm. or uh, anything like cousins, stuff like that. Right. So of these nephews, the one that's going to be the focus of the Borgia family is Rodrigo, who was also sent to study law at the University of Bologna. And while his uncle amassed benefits and money for them, he went to go pretty much become another administrator for the family. And also, Rodrigo, like I mentioned, was apparently a stud. Yeah. Good looking man. <laughs> and while all this was happening, the Pope went up and died. Rest in peace. Was this Pope innocent? Uh, this was... I don't remember. I know it's not crucial to the story. I was just I taking so. a guess. I, I think this is a different one. Because Pope Innocent comes before Alexander. Oh, After correct. Calixtus. Yeah. So, what names? <laughs> I know. <laughs> <laughs> that was the biggest thing that stood out to me. Like, very, very Renaissance names. Yes. So, surprisingly, or perhaps not surprisingly, Alfonso de Borgia was elected Pope on April 9th, 1455, and he changed his name from Alfonso to Calixtus III. Very, very funny that there's two other ones <laughs> yeah, before I know. him, Calixtus. Who was the first guy that was like, I'm going to call myself Calixtus? Where does that come from? Well, let's definitely take that to the internet. Yeah, so... A very quick turn of events. I mean, in 1420, he got into the services of the king of Aragon, and 35 years later, he's the pope. I mean, Calixtus finally found some background on this bad boy. He was the... <laughs> no way. 
Well, according to Britannica.com, the first uh, fun fact is it was the church's first anti-pope. I don't know what the term, I think that means that there were a pope that was trying to take over as secondary pope. Secondary pope, yeah. So I think that's what anti-pope means. Yeah, quick synopsis, he was originally a slave, basically denounced as a Christian by the Jews, had him sentenced to the Sardinian mines. Once he returned back to power, la da 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 eventually becomes Pope. But very, very interesting. But it doesn't say anything about the name choice? Not, well, his name was Callistus. Oh, okay. Yeah. So he just didn't change his name. Yeah. Gotcha. That all sounded like a Lord of the Rings story. He went to the Sardinian mines. Especially the la di da 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 Yeah. <laughs> So the reason that Alfonso de Borgia was elected pope was pretty much because the council realized he was old and they kind of used him as an intermediary pope while they kind of tried to decide who would succeed him and who would be the best candidate because he wasn't going to be around that long. So it was kind of a good compromise for two of the powerful Roman families who were involved in the elections mm-hmm. to bide their time until they could come up with a candidate that both of them agreed on. A very funny stalemate. Like, let's have yeah. Joe Biden get up there <laughs> or be the papacy or be the pope. There's a backroom handshake deal between the Republicans and Democrats to elect, like, some random guy. Right, we'll let this guy fake give out handshakes on stage <laughs> yeah. until we figure something out. After he was elected, one of Calixtus's the first acts as pope was to try and organize a crusade. Because you gotta get the Holy Land. They love Crusades. Constantinople had fallen to the Turks, and he wanted to take it back, but unfortunately for him, and perhaps thankfully for everyone else, Crusades were mostly a thing of the past, and his energy was diverted elsewhere, even though he was able to raise a small fleet of ships and take back a few smaller islands from the Turks. Everyone that put him in power just heard Crusade, and they're like, whoa, 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 let's pump the brakes This here, is your guy. first 100-day plan? <laughs> yeah, my 100-day plan. Take back the frickin' Constantinople. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Calixtus used money collected by the former pope to fund this fleet that he built, leading to some of the Roman families disapproving of him an- immediately, and it didn't help that he was Roman, or not Roman, he was Spanish mm-hmm. in origin. And it also was combined with the fact that he took the level of nepotism to a new high in the papal courts. After he was officially elected pope, he lavishly awarded his nephews once again, making Rodrigo and another nephew into cardinals despite their young ages. Yeah, they were 20. Yeah, Rodrigo was 25 when he was turned into a cardinal for the church. Insane. (laughs) Because, I mean, on Alfonso's part, he was probably 45. Like late 40s, early 50s. I'd have mm-hmm. to do the math, but yeah, he takes his 25 younger than us and makes him into one of the highest positions A in the cardinal. Vatican. Yeah, it's <laughs> very, 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 very silly. I was going to say filthy, but that too. <laughs> sure. <laughs> Countless other relatives received perks and jobs to help Calixtus run his new government oversight in the Papal States, which increased the economy, but further alienated him from the Roman nobility. He's basically just using his family to run the administration instead of what normally happens, which is where he takes people from Rome and elects them. Right, because it is the Roman Pope. Yeah. So you can see why these two different families in Rome are getting pretty upset with this Spanish guy. Yeah, he's like, come on, guys, I'm Italian, but like all of his R's are rolled. Yeah. <laughs> you can tell you're Spanish. He keeps on serving paella <laughs> at dinners. <laughs> Calixtus was accused of being an uneducated pope by those, uh, his contemporaries, but in reality, he was kind of the opposite. And while he wasn't a humanist and wasn't well versed in the arts, he was still a prominent and knowledgeable legal scholar. He even reviewed Joan of Arc's trial and a he acquitted her of her crimes post mortem. <laughs> Can't really save her wow, anymore. Thank, but <laughs> what a hero, <laughs> <Yeah>. man. <laughs> he just kind of burned her already, but <laughs> he just missed it. Just missed her. Yeah. Yeah. He was accused of squandering the funds of the previous pope, but he pretty much just paused spending on building projects and other arts to help fund his crusade he was planning, while also continuing conservation and restoration projects for monuments and basilicas in Rome. So it's not that he wasn't a, per, he didn't really 
stop all of the art funding or anything. He just kind of paused certain aspects of it. And keep in mind, again, this is the Pope that's doing all of this, that's raising funds for fleets, that's raising funds for building and infrastructure, and yeah, a whole new war. So just the amount of power that this position holds at this time, it's way more way more than anyone else. And without that context, it doesn't really make a lot of sense how the Borgia family runs. You kind of need that background information to see. It's a completely different dynamic than what we're used to. Mm -hmm. All in all, Calixtus was a good pope who applied the church laws to the best of his ability. And his only real flaw was how dedicated he was to the crusade, which ultimately led to his death after only three years as the pope. The nepotism he showed for his close family may have been exaggerated after his death, but it is true that he did practice a little more expansively than the prior popes. But in his wake, Calixtus left Rodrigo de Borgia to continue the family legacy in the papal courts. Rodrigo continued to serve in the Roman Curia after his uncle's death, which was kind of the high council in the Vatican. And he would see four popes come and go from the position before he eventually took the office in 1492, after Pope Innocent VIII died. Throughout the preceding years, Rodrigo used his keen administrative abilities, similar to his uncle, to amass more power for himself and establish a backing for his run at the position of the papacy. He also had time to find a mistress or two and have (laughs) four children with one of them, two of which, Cesare and Lucrezia, will become important later on. Yeah, man loved the honeys. Yeah, he (laughs) was a womanizer. (laughs) Isn't it kind of crazy that this is also, like, the new world was just quote-unquote discovered by Columbus? Yeah, same year. (laughs) Just recently, like, a little close. Yeah. Yeah. But in general, Rodrigo was known as a worldly man who who indulged in pleasures of the flesh quite often, which helped build a reputation around him. Oh, yeah, there was quite a stink on this guy. I mean, he was very dedicated to the church as well. It's not saying that his only ambitions were earthly ambitions, but those are the ones that stood out amongst everything else. Yeah, and he, we'll talk about it a little bit, but he was not shy about it Oh, no. (laughs) Other rumors contend that Rodrigo used his wealth and status to basically buy the position of the Pope, paying off his contenders and bribing his way into the power. Now, this story has been largely discredited and seen as another rumor told to demonize the Borgias, so it's more likely that the voting was politically motivated for his election. However, one of the cardinals who didn't vote for Rodrigo would continue to be an enemy of the Borgia family for years to come. Forever. (laughs) Yes. So, I mean, the story of him buying the papacy, it was kind of a custom to exchange money between hands when Mm. a new pope was elected. So it's not like he did anything that out of the norm, but there are records stating that he paid four wagonfuls of silver to one guy and stuff like that. So who knows? Maybe he did kind of buy his way into it, but... Yeah, I think the Borgias uh, definitely kind of get that Nero treatment, like in our Nero episode where we talked about how he was over-vilified. I would say, uh, with the different stories that people came up with them, mostly from his political enemies. And in this case, the Borgias aren't like excerpt from that. Yeah. Like they definitely get, like they definitely did their stuff, but they probably didn't do everything that they were accused of. And it's a very similar situation in Nero and the fact that he was one of the last of the Judeo Claudian Empire and they're the last of the Borgia pretty much Mm -hmm. until later on when another guy shows up and does something cool. But um. Yeah. The, 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 their enemies had free reign to kind yeah. of say whatever they wanted. Right. I mean, yeah. It's the papal courts. <laughs> you can't really just challenge someone to a duel, for example. <laughs> right, exactly. After taking the genital exam to verify that Rodrigo was indeed a man, he changed his name and became Pope Alexander the Sixth. You're going to need to say that one more time for the people in the back. <clears throat> After taking the genital exam to verify that Rodrigo was indeed a man, he changed his name and became Pope Alexander VI. 
Ah, uh, the papacy. Yeah, they, <laughs> I didn't really read super into it, but from what I did see, I, think I don't that, think you need to read too into that. It's just, pretty self-explanatory. Well, they had him sit on like a really low chair, and then they just like examined just to make sure that they're like, "Yep, there's two of those and one of those." There we go. Go good get to, him, Tiger. Good to go. Yes, pat him on the butt and get out of here, champ. Taking example from Innocent the Eighth before him, Alexander acknowledged his illegitimate children and began to load them up with riches and titles. Rodrigo quickly went into action and reformed the Roman Curia, which he was formerly a part of, in addition to forbidding simony, or simony, which is the act of effectively buying the papacy, which he had apparently just done. <laughs> which is the act of discriminating against everyone named Simon. <laughs> I guess I probably should have looked up the pronunciation on that one, but it's spelled S A. S, it's spelled like Simon, S-I-M-O-N, with a Y at the end. Yeah, it's either the most ironic thing that a pope has ever passed, or he was just being genuine. Like, <laughs> yeah. No one else can get accused of this but me. Right. In addition, the Romans, who had already looked unfavorably on the Borgias, run as pope because they were Spanish, actually began to like Alexander. He was a patron of the arts, unlike his uncle before him. And basically, his run as Pope was off to a good start. But in short order, his attention turned towards his earthly wants, which were money, women, and family. I feel like there's a rap song about that. <laughs> <laughs> Probably. This is where the Borgia reputation as hedonistic and vile truly begins to make itself known. <laughs> yeah, things get wild with the rumor mill. Yeah, this, this is where nepotism becomes what nepotism is. Mm -hmm. Alexander named his 18-year-old son, Cesare, a cardinal, along with an even younger boy who was the brother of one of his papal mistresses. Yeah, that's, <laughs> that is outrageous. So not even 20 yet. Then he organized politically motivated marriages for his daughter, Lucrezia, the first of which took place when she was the absolutely geriatric age of 13 wild time to get married like 13 years old she's had a crazy upbringing i mean she was the daughter of an affair of a very high powerful man but it didn't really stop it like his father or her father was also having affairs with other women his or excuse me her mother just happened to be the longest running one yeah. right so she was just the favorite of an affair um i mean alexander before he became pope had like five or six notable mistresses that they mentioned mm -hmm. in sources so he he got around right and it's interesting with lucrezia her brothers and her father all very it's especially cesare and her father like all very powerful or just greedy men i would say and they use lucrezia as a scapegoat for a majority of yeah. what they do like in the time Right, so... I mean, she was engaged at the age of 12 to two different people, which both got canceled once he became Pope, once Alexander became Pope. Yep. And then he was like, well, now I need you for political advantage. Right, now you're going to marry someone else because the original family that he had her lined up with, like, lost power. Yep. And so it wasn't beneficial to them. So it's like, yeah. she's really just getting told where to go and who to marry, and she really has no mother either her mother was very distant in their relationship growing up she had a weird relationship with one of her father's other mistresses who just happened to be where she was being brought up so very odd and yeah. of course i mean by all reports she was a very attractive woman too yeah i, I heard her described as a blonde hair gray-eyed beauty <laughs> yep admirably proportioned bust was one description as well that is it seems like that is a very common thing that they like to record the bus. in the Renaissance <laughs> time period. Uh, but as Evan mentioned, her first marriage wasn't going to last long since its usefulness expired pretty soon after the marriage, and Alexander had it annulled on the grounds that the marriage was never consummated and that her husband was impotent. Yes, there was also rumors that the husband was homosexual. I heard that today as well. Yeah. <laughs> So and, like, there's just accusation accusations being thrown out willy nilly during he, this trial. He was pretty much just 
checking boxes and saying, let me throw everything at this one so that we can get this marriage over with and move on. Fast. Yeah. yeah. And this move has a pretty long lasting impact on the Borgia name for centuries. Because not wanting his reputation to be tarnished, Lucrezia's first husband began to spread rumors of incest about the Borgia family, likely at first saying that she was sleeping with her father. And it wasn't, Alexander wasn't helped by the fact that he was sleeping with one of Lucrezia's young friends as one of his mistresses. So, yeah, that'll do it. <laughs> But regardless, the marriage was successfully annulled, and the former husband later did admit to being impotent after all, but that was possibly a forced confession. So it's not really certain if that was true or not. Right, and with this one, I mean, when it finally was annulled, she was already six months pregnant when it was officially annulled. Yeah. So we have scandals everywhere. And once she has the kid, which who's, the name will be Rodrigo once the kid is born... They, he just Alexander just says, yeah, that was Cesare's son. Ooh. So, <laughs> Ooh. not to cause any more scandal. Uh. <laughs> Lucrezia's second marriage was quickly organized after the first, and this was probably one of the roughest patches of this young girl's life, because one of her brothers at the same time period was murdered, and his body was found floating in the Tiber River with multiple stab wounds. And almost immediately after he was found murdered, the rumors began to spread that Cesare had killed him, so her older brother. But there was no evidence to prove it one way or another, and it's still kind of a mystery to this day how her brother Giovanni ended up dead in the Tiber River. Mm -hmm. So, But it, it was definitely beneficial for Cesare because he overtook Giovanni's position afterwards. So, Yeah. I also heard reports that uh, it was a jealousy situation, like Cesare was in love with Lucrezia, and so was the other brother, Giovanni, so... Yeah, and that's where, like, these it, incest rumors really start to spin. Yes, yeah, like, you almost get a Romeo-Juliet type thing, or, like, it's just an odd situation. It, very much so. Yeah. But regardless of her brother's death, Lucrezia's second marriage uh, once again quickly outlived its political advantages for Alexander and Cesare. And this time, however, the marriage would end in quite a different way. Cesare was tasked with getting rid of Lucrezia's second husband, also named Alfonso, but he was Alfonso of Aragon. Yeah, for those counting, that's the third Alfonso. Third Alfonso. At first, Cesare sent a band of mercenaries to take care of Alfonso, but they failed in their mission when Alfonso's bodyguards protected him. And so when Alfonso retreated to his chambers to recover from his injuries, Cesare sent another man to break into Alfonso's room and strangle him to death. According to reports, Lucrezia actually was in love with Alfonso and had a mm -hmm. child with him. So after this occurred, she was probably stricken with a Great amount of grief. Yeah, she genuinely loved this man. Uh, she wore black for a long time, mourned him quite a bit, uh, really didn't do any public appearances for a long time after this happened as well. So she was really, really... She is the victim in a lot of cases. Yeah, in as, this. as I mentioned, probably the roughest patch in her life right now. Later on, the murder of her second husband would once again fuel the incest rumors between Cesare and Lucrezia, but less than two years later, Lucrezia found herself at the marriage altar once again for the third and final time betrothed to another Alfonso, this time the Duke of Ferrara. Alfonso IV, this time it's, it's for, for real. <laughs> so yeah, she finally gets married to her final husband. The, the one that she'll be with for the rest of her life. Now, this is when it gets like a little bit happier for her. Yeah, So, and we'll get into her a little more as we go on and later mm -hmm. in the story, and we'll talk a little bit more about some of the more positive notes in Lucrezia's life. But back to Alexander, his year of election was 1492. And you know what else happened in 1492, Evan? Columbus sailed the ocean blue. That's right. The Jews got expelled from Spain. Oh, well. <laughs> yeah, that, I mean, people were... People were, uh, uh, I'm forgetting, the inquisiting. Quite yeah. A bit. yeah. <laughs> the eternal rival of everybody for some reason. Of the everyone. Jews. Yeah. Oh, and Christopher Columbus discovered the New World. 
So a year after he became Pope, Alexander had to try and argue for who would get the new land in the new world. At first, Alexander pushed against Portugal and favored Spain heavily in his decree since the Borgias were always Spanish at heart, but the act was modified in 1494 to be more fair to both sides and kind of just split it down the middle saying Spain gets everything to one side and Portugal gets everything to the other side, pretty much go nuts. And then England came along yeah. and said, actually, hey, <laughs> oi. <laughs> In the case of the Jews getting kicked out of Spain, Alexander actually allowed them to take refuge in Rome and the surrounding areas, which is a good thing morally speaking. But since the Jews have always been an enemy, some of the Romans didn't really like the move of taking them in as refugees. Yeah, it's one of those things that, have, that has always been prevalent through human society. People do not like letting people down on their luck into their space. And yeah, I mean... Alexander, from all accounts, was like morally an okay person mm -hmm. when it came to big picture things. Like when it came to his personal life, it was a little different. Got a little dicey. Yeah, but acts like this, he did do some good things. It's not mm -hmm. like he was always focused on being a bastard. <laughs> right, right. I mean, even, even Lucrezia's life later, she was an advocate for Jewish refugees in her city. Yeah, it's just sad to see that People who already aren't fond of him just use it as another excuse to say, we don't like you again. Yeah, right. More locally, Alexander cut down on crime by investigating the some 200 plus assassinations that took place in a matter of months in and around Rome by finding those responsible and hanging them on the spot and raising their homes to the ground. Oh yeah, he came down hard on this apparent group of bandits. Yeah, it was just that there was a lot. Everything was chaotic in Rome, mm -hmm. as I mentioned earlier, so people were just killing everyone left and right. Yeah, 200 different fires in, yeah. in Renaissance Rome. This is the tough-on-crime propaganda for, or, for Renaissance Rome. Boy, went Richard Nixon on. Yeah. <laughs> But this is where the buck stops with his respectability for the most part. Along with Cesare, who was mainly a military leader for Alexander, the Borgias subjugated rich opponents to bolster their own coffers as well as weaken their enemies. Cardinals, noblemen, and officials were accused of crimes, taken to prison, or murdered, and then their properties were taken by Alexander and his family. And then Alexander had to deal with a possible French invasion of Naples. Since the king of Naples had died, and the French king had a long-distance claim to the throne, Alexander allowed him to march his troops into Italy under the plan to use these French troops against the Turks as part of a crusade. Oh, came right full circle. However, the French king actually had his sights set on Naples, and once he was in Italy, it began the Italian War, which would last for over 60 years. <laughs> Oof. <laughs> Misjudged that one. <laughs> How did I play that one wrong? Yeah. <laughs> France initially took control of Naples, but soon after, Alexander was able to organize Italian forces and fight them off and take back control of Naples. So it took a French invasion for the Romans to finally say, okay, you're the Pope, we'll help you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> During this time is when Cesare resigns as a cardinal for the first time in history to pursue political and warfare matters, officially becoming the secular lieutenant for Alexander. Yeah, the first time everyone's been like, I'm good with being one of the most powerful people in the world. Yeah, and it's a position you're supposed to hold for life. Yeah. So, it's not, it's very surprising. I think this is why they get such a reputation, because he does stuff like this. Yeah, decides to call it quits. Yeah. But pretty shortly after his 11th anniversary of becoming Pope, Alexander and Cesare both got sick. Rumors have said that Alexander was perhaps poisoned by either an enemy of the Borgias or even by his own son Cesare, but it's also likely that the Pope just got something like malaria and died from that. Alexander was officially declared dead on eight, the 18th of August, 1503, but Cesare, however, would recover. It, he's a hard guy to kill. He is. And this is where the rumor mill really muddies the story, because there was rumors that the eternal rival of the Borgias, who was one of the electoral guys that got kind of gypped, 
say that like maybe someone from his family who they were planning to kill mm-hmm. got to him for, got to Alexander first or that Cesare tried to poison him and accidentally got some poison himself and then they both got sick or something so you don't know nobody knows how he actually died there's too much poison going around oh yeah i mean alexander's literally called the poison pope yeah they like poison (laughs) yeah they love good poison alexander the sixth has gained the reputation as being one of the worst popes in history and while he was much more secularly focused than other popes most of his actions weren't unheard of in the papal courts before his rule Nepotism was already prevalent, just more so under Alexander. Mistresses were already prevalent, just more so under Alexander. War efforts were already prevalent, just more so under Alexander. At the end of the day, Alexander was not a great and moral leader for the church and the world, but he has been demonized much more than he deserves by his contemporaries after his death to place more shadows on his life. Yes, very much so. Like, he did very bad things i don't think there's any real doubt about that but i do think it was one of those situations where it's a foreign pope and so you have to bash said foreign pope with all these different rumors even going so far as to saying that they had a or he had a baby with his own daughter yeah just so that this almost so it never happens again which shocking enough like yeah there's more popes that aren't roman (laughs) yeah exactly (laughs) so i mean wasn't the best guy but also wasn't the worst pope (laughs) like he did do things that i think people they were big picture things too like Mm -hmm. 1492 is a very important year around the world and he had to take into account a lot of those major changes and he made decisions on a lot of them which changed the landscape of the world forever oh my gosh yeah just saying that these two countries had to split the new world too yeah yeah, those are big decisions. And then the Spanish did a lot of bad stuff. <laughs> oh, yeah, the Spanish. They didn't do a lot of good. So I mean, all of South, Central, and Western America. Yeah. <laughs> so we briefly touched on Cesare and Lucrezia, and we didn't really go into who they really were. So Cesare was a handsome young man who took quite a lead from his father, He also took legal studies as a youth, but never really took into the religious side of things as much, as is seen by the fact that he eventually becomes a cardinal and then renounces it, because he reveled in wealth and fine clothes, and especially in taking mistresses and fighting. Didn't take long for Cesare's name to become linked to pretty brutal ruthlessness. Once he was made the lieutenant of the papal forces after his brother Giovanni was killed, he began to march out on campaigns to the north of Rome to help reestablish papal authority in central Italy. His efforts may have been more of a way to carve out a power base for the Borgia family to occupy, but regardless, he did begin to subjugate lands in the area with the help of the French, surprisingly enough. Bonjour, bonjour. So it's it's already like immediately once he becomes the more military leader for his father, he begins to take the uh, the precedent that his father has set for trying to establish a line of wealth mm-hmm. for the family for the Borgia family, and he says, okay, well if we're gonna have a line of succession for this wealth to go through, we're gonna need lands and we're gonna need somewhere to establish ourselves like as a base of power. Mm-hmm. And that's pretty much what he does immediately when he be, be, when he gets enough forces to fight. It's real life risk. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. However, while he was on his campaigns, his captains soon began to realize that Cesare's ambitions may have been larger than they expected, and that his movements might infringe on their own lands in central Italy. So <laughs> soon after, they hatched a plot to assassinate Cesare, but he found out. It's like they start marching closer and closer. Like, hey, these are pretty nice lands. I recognize the... Wait, I recognize these lands. (laughs) (laughs) Their kids are like waving. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. So Cesare finds out about this assassination plot and sends word to the plotters that he was going to reward them substantially if they would stay true to him. But at the same time, he hired more French soldiers and more bodyguards for himself. Shortly after, Cesare began to feign his compassion and sent a treaty to the conspirators to be signed, 
and the men did sign it, and it was returned to Cesare, who went to join the men right around Christmas time. To make the men feel more secure, Cesare sent his French reinforcements away and moved into the city of Senegalia to join the former conspirators. Ooh, just a nice little party. We're just hanging out. It's Christmas time. I'm, give, I'm coming to give you presents. Yeah. Cesare told the conspirators to send their men out of the city because his troops needed to come into the city. Once inside, his troops cut the conspirators off from their men and, fooling them with fake kindness, lured them into a selected house. And once Cesare raised a signal, the conspirators were overpowered by his men and they were held in this selected house until the next morning. The next day, the two men were tied back to back on a bench by their necks and an iron bar was placed through the cord around their necks and it was turned until it strangled both of the men to death. The last of the conspirators were then garroted later the next month. What a wild, wild story. Yeah. Just garroting people left and right. Ew. <laughs> Cesare's ruthless and cunning punishment was seen as a, quote, rare and wonderful exploit by Niccolo Machiavelli, who was a famous 16th century philosopher and political figure. And at this point, it seemed that Cesare's violent and merciless attitudes were seemingly doing well for himself. Yeah, you gotta give, a, give him a hand. I mean, he lays down the law on yeah. people trying to kill him. Him and his father are both very tough on crime, apparently. They do not stand for any nonsense. Yeah. No nonsense shall be had on their watch. But on the, uh, on the point of Machiavelli, he, a lot of people say that Cesare is the inspiration for one of Machiavelli's most famous works. Mm -hmm. uh, I think it's just called The Prince. Yep. Yeah. And so Machiavelli speaks very highly of Cesare. He's one of the only people really to have a good thing to say about yeah, how, have this guy's how he was. Yeah. <laughs> and he's pretty much just saying like he was ruthless, but he was very good at being ruthless. I mean, he was good at his job. He's yeah. a very successful man at this point in his life. In right, addition, his dad was the Pope for a long yeah, time, but still. True. In addition to his military exploits, Cesare is also one of the main contributors to the rumor of one of the most scandalous parties in papal history, the Banquet of Chestnuts. Ooh. In 1501, in Cesare's apartment in the Vatican, a party was held that contained decadent food and wine, music and dance, and eventually, a massive orgy. Ooh. Yay! <laughs> Apparently, Alexander not only attended, but also participated in the proceedings. And according to the documents recorded by the Papal Master of Ceremonies, the party went as follows. This is all going to be a quote. In the evening, 50 decent prostitutes or courtesans had dinner with Duke Valentino, which is what they called Cesare, in his room in the Apostolic Palace, and after dinner, the courtesans danced with the servants first in their clothes and then naked. After dinner, lampstands holding lighted candles were placed on the floor around the table, and chestnuts were strewn around them, which the prostitutes, naked and on their hands and knees, had to pick up. The Pope, the Duke, and his sister Lucrezia were all present and watching. Finally, prizes were offered silken doublets, pairs of shoes, hats, and other garments for those who knew the greatest number of these prostitutes carnally. Oh. End quote. <laughs> oh. Oh my gosh. So whoever has the most sex gets gifts. Gets a gift. <laughs> a little controversial to be held in the Vatican, I'd say. In St. No, Peter's Basilica wasn't built yet, I believe. But still, oh my god, that is so crazy. Yeah, and... This is probably one of the most lasting rumors about the Borgia family was this event. And there's so many different artists that have painted stuff representing the Banquet of Chestnuts. Like there's one where it's just a woman with a guy behind some iron bars who's pegging her from behind. Oh, God. <laughs> it's, it's like there's so many different artist representations to signify this event. Yeah. And the fact that the Papal Master of Ceremonies recorded this is pretty significant, I'd say. What a time to be committed to your job. Yeah, right. <laughs> like, he's like, hold on, everyone. I gotta write this down. 
So naturally, this is quite an extravagant and scandalous rumor, but since it was recorded as a small section of an otherwise quite dry and official document, it is likely that it's actually true. It yeah, I can't imagine that guy has too exciting of a job writing everything that happens. It's like someone came in with an issue or something important, blah, 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 very dry, like papal lost. Yeah. <laughs> and then chestnuts. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, even the way he wrote it in that was pretty dry. Like, it's just matter of fact. This is what happened. This is who was there. <laughs> yeah. Now, it's obviously not a common occurrence by any means, but it did seem to happen at least this one time and could perhaps contribute to the stories of incest amongst the Borgia family, since the, all of them were in attendance. All of them were present. <laughs> yeah. The good times didn't last for Cesare, however, because after his father died, Cesare knew that he couldn't do much without the papal backing that he once had. He was able to use his influence to help appoint the next pope, but that guy died in like a month. <laughs> so the next pope, Julius II, tricked Cesare into supporting his cause for election, but once Julius II was officially the pope, he revealed that he was the lifelong enemy of the Borgia family all the way back to the contentious election of Alexander. What a twist. What a twist. <laughs> How the turntables. Yeah, right. Cesare was forced to flee Rome and was eventually caught and imprisoned, but escaped after two years and fled to France to serve his brother-in-law. And while in his brother-in-law's service, Cesare died during a siege at the age of 31. What a guy. Yeah. I mean, going from the... Dance of chestnuts, celebration of chestnuts, yeah, feast of chestnuts, to then just dying in a siege. But 31 years, that's a lot of life to live. That's I mean, why I'm what we say a lot on the show, but wowza. I mean, he was a cardinal at 18, so he started very early in this endeavor to right. try and make a name for himself. But uh, this is another point that Machiavelli brings up in his writings about Cesare is that if he didn't get sick around the same time that Alexander did when Alexander died, Cesare probably would have been okay because mm -hmm. that hindered his ability to really set himself up for what was coming next. He didn't have a chance to make moves in that time period, and it also just weakened his position. So I mean, if if he didn't get sick and if he had more time to fight and gain more properties and more riches and establish himself more probably could have weathered this storm but yeah could be talking about the borgias even today as a real family today yeah oh, as for, man as for lucrezia we talked a bit about her early life from the prospect of being married three times in short succession and her third marriage did begin with doubts, mostly from her new husband, since he had to try and justify the fact that not only had Lucrezia's first two marriages not worked out, but one of the husbands had been brutally murdered. <laughs> yes, quite brutally murdered. And also that she was being accused of having the love child of her father. <laughs> There's a lot of things being said about A lot this of moment. points, a lot of points being made. But this third husband, I think, does a very interesting thing. He actually hires spies to go and investigate Lucrezia because, of course, there's a rumor mill. There's everything that you hear from other nobles. He actually hired spies. A private investigator. If, if you, you will. will, yes. Uh, just take up different spots, different jobs in the place where she was. And they all described her as, I'm paraphrasing here, but said that she had grace with everything that she did, that she was kind, that she wasn't this support supposed monster right and a lot of what her connotations are even today in a lot of shows and films um is that and this is a great quote that i heard was that she was the personification of the evil of women <laughs> <laughs> yeah meaning like she committed adultery she committed uh incest she murdered people she did basically whatever she could that wasn't considered like holy womanly activity. But these spies uh, followed her for quite some time before the marriage officially happened. And they said, no, she's pretty straightforward. She's, she's A-OK. -okay. And they described the, uh, her bust again. <laughs> <laughs> of course. I mean, yeah. that is an important factor in the marriage process. Oh, of course. Of course. Yeah. But eventually, after the marriage was official, the two did grow to love each other, and Lucrezia bore seven children with Alfonso in the span of about 12 years. So, doing her job as a wife in this time period, I guess you could say. Her life became very stable, 
very calm and, for lack of a better word, normal as soon as her father and brother died. She didn't have to worry about the crazies in the family. She could just be committed wife and just be with her husband, be with her huge family. Yeah, and I think once, even before they died, once Cesare was kind of on his campaigns in central Italy, Mm -hmm. she was kind of out of the picture. She did her own thing at that point. They kind of just left her alone once she was married off to the Duke of Ferrara because they didn't really, I I don't think they really saw a need to marry her off again at that point. So, yeah. Yeah, and like her now husband at this point, they actually have hobbies together. Like they're both patron of the arts. They love music. They love the community. They love the Renaissance. Yeah. Uh, She was, by all accounts, too, a loving and devoted mother to the children that they had together. And she was a fair and just duchess to the new area of Ferrara that she was living in. Her punishments were said to be fair, and the people of Ferrara grew to love and respect her as their patron. And as Evan just mentioned, she associated herself with artists and writers, brought a lot of them into the courts from places as far away as the Vatican. And in addition to her responsibilities in the courts, Lucrezia was also a successful and shrewd businesswoman. She used some of the wealth she had accrued to build hospitals and convents, while also investing in marshlands, which she drained and used for agriculture. Mm -hmm. And in one of the more Italian things that she did, she began a business selling mozzarella cheese. That's beautiful. (laughs) That's just... mm. Can't make it up. From one cheese fan to another. (laughs) Props. I love it. Grazie. And in addition, she also had a lot of water buffalo. (laughs) So that's very random. Not not sure if that has any bearing on anything, but I just thought it was a funny point that someone mentioned. Water buffalo are in Italy, apparently. <laughs> so I don't huh? know. I don't. I really. Where don't, does the water buffalo reside? I really don't know where Ferrara actually was. Well, I guess this is kind of a flex that she had water buffalo, which are from the Indian subcontinent in Southeast Asia. Sam shipped up. Oh, it's like just north of Florence. Okay, so it's northern Italy. Yeah. So. She did a lot of agriculture stuff and grew some, made some cheese. I was going to say grew some cheese. Grew some <laughs> on not a how, cheese farm. That's not how cheese works. But for, there was even a short time period in her life when Alexander was still alive that she was put into the position of regent in Rome, in the Vatican. And that was quite scandalous for the time since women weren't allowed to wield power in the Vatican or even really be in the Vatican. Or so, do anything with the yeah. with religion. However, any power she had during her life couldn't save her from illness because at the age of 39, Lucrezia died from a fever 10 days after giving birth to a stillborn daughter. Due to her reputation and attachment to the Borgia family, Lucrezia's reputation has had centuries to become that of a villainess. A husband in a divorce in a short period of time doesn't look good, especially with the rumors of incest accompanying it. And a second husband being murdered in a quite violent and nearly public way doesn't really help Lucrezia's public perception either. And it seems that up until her third marriage, she really didn't have much of a chance to set the record for herself, but was rather at the mercy of her male family members' whims for her. The second half of her story seems to be more independent and full of good experiences, so it seems that she may have been more of a victim than villain in the overall story of the Borgia family. Yeah, history is definitely being a lot more kind to her as of late like for the longest time she was just part of the borgia you know that name with associated with incest and being power hungry and greedy but yeah history nowadays is giving her some slack yeah especially with the situations with her first two husbands which weren't really her own decisions in any way right like she didn't choose to marry them them. yeah and she didn't she didn't choose to marry them she didn't choose to divorce them or Mm. murder them that was all Alexander and Cesare. So yeah. she really didn't have a say until she got married the third time and then finally had some of her own life. Right. The story of the Borgias does continue after our four main protagonists, but not nearly in the same capacity as before. After their papal run, the House of Borgia loses much of its power and status. And aside from one member of the family, Francis Borgia, who actually became a saint later on, no one was really notable after these four people were gone. However, the story of the Borgia family has spawned into its own beast in media like movies and video games today. So is the reputation deserved? Well, maybe it is. But to me, it seems like they were 
an extremely secular group of men put into an extremely advantageous position of power that allowed them to pursue their earthly desires unhindered. And thus, you get the reputation of the Borgia family. One of the most, I would say, probably one of the most influential families of history. You talk about you only have 150-ish years of a run to get two popes, a saint, and a daughter that you know, does very well for herself. Yeah. Quite an impact on a country. Yeah. Especially- that started That started as, or the family started as administrators. Yeah. It's just kind of, we're good at filing paperwork. Hell of a system that they got <laughs> yeah. going on. So, I mean, that's a Borgia family, man. I, they were crazy, to say the least. Very crazy. Would we always talk about if you could travel back in time and just see things happening? Just how that feast of the chestnuts the started. Of chestnuts. Of chestnuts, yeah. <laughs> oh, gosh. Like, how does something like that start just... Hey guys, want to have some wine? Or yeah, I, well, and I just love that the Vatican is so poo poo on having women in the Vatican. <laughs> the Vatican is so poo poo, and then and then they're just like, let's have fifty prostitutes come to dinner. Actually, these hoes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so they they had a wild run, a uh, very crazy. They they had a very crazy ascent to power, and also one of it was the quickest ascent and decline of power. I think in this time period, they're a real supernova. Yeah. They burn bright, burn fast. Burn fast, maybe sleep with each other, who knows? <laughs> yeah, I. Th- as far as the incest rumors go, it's pretty much all rumors. There's no evidence for any of it or anything, so yeah. I mean, by all accounts, none of them actually slept with one another. It was just like, Alexander was sleeping with Lucrezia's teenage friends, yeah. while she- Lucrezia was also a teenager. Yeah, so, it, yeah. there's it, not a ton to give actual credence to those yeah. rumors. Yeah, it's just kind of uh, biased sources by biased people after they're gone. So, yes. Yeah. Hope you guys enjoyed the uh, story of the Borgia family. Yes, and if you want to continue that conversation, you can do it in several different ways. We have multiple ways to engage. First off, you can subscribe to our Patreon. Patreon subscribers, we currently have one level of patronage, one level of subscribership. Words are very hard. Yes. <laughs> well, we have one level, and uh, that is our Ruby level. You can get episodes early, you can get a sticker, and you can also vote on our listener-selected topics, which that should be coming out relatively soon, so keep your eye out for voting there. Should uh, be the next episode after this one. There we go. There yeah. we go. I think voting's officially over for it, so we already know what we're doing, but well, you right. can get on the next one <laughs> if you want to join the Patreon. Yeah. Uh, you can also follow us on Twitter at gems underscore history, Jacob at Jacob from Wisco, myself at Whatevskis. Find us on Instagram, YouTube, TikTok, and Facebook at Gems of History Podcast. Just put that in the search bar and you should be able to find us. Yeah. So thank you to everyone who has already subscribed to the Patreon. We truly do appreciate the support. It really means a lot to us. Uh, also, we have an email address if people want to email us anything. It's just gemsofhistorypodcast at gmail.com. Haven't plugged that in a millennia. But, Brad, it existed. But you can get in contact with us there as well. Um, but yeah, that's all we got for you guys this week. We will be back next week with the listener chosen topic. And then we will start our next month. And you guys can start brainstorming your ideas for another one. So until then, everyone have a great week. We love you and appreciate you for listening. Stay polished.